awesome. Thank you all. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think, think through my mind. Hallelujah. Think through my mind, Lord. None of me, all of you, and we give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give the Lord a big hand clap before you sit down. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 19, and we're going we're gonna to start at verse 8. I want to kind of set a, a foundation for where we're going here. We've been talking about overcoming condemnation and really trying to understand it in light of our living, you know? That sometimes we hear the word condemnation, but we're not really visualizing what it looks like in our everyday lives. And condemnation becomes the foundation uh, basically for a lot of negative things that you're, you're trying to overcome. For example, condemnation is responsible for fear. I thought fear was the bottom line, but condemnation is the root. Condemnation produces the fear and all the fears you have to deal with. And if you don't understand the root of it and you just try to deal with fear, then you'll find yourself moving to the next stage where you're dealing with the stresses of life. And stress is absolutely an enemy that will be responsible for transferring uh, the curse in your physical body and in your soul. And because as a result of stress, you begin to see and experience the manifestations of the curse, the death cycle begins to take place. And yet, I still don't think that the body of Christ as a whole has really gotten a hold of condemnation and what it looks like and, and what it looks like on your journey, you know, because our Christian life is a, a journey that we're taking. And so I want to look at this, this scripture. We, we're studying the book of John on Wednesday night with the Wednesday night crew, and, and we're getting into just like every detail, right? And so the word of the Lord came by Moses to the people of God. And something really happened here, and I encourage you to read the whole chapter. But when he gave the word in verse 8, Exodus 19, he said, and all the people answered together, all of them. And they said, all that the Lord hath spoken, these three words right here, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord, and I encourage you to read the rest of it, but then we, when he returned the, 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 the three words back to God, something happened because God was like, go on, get everybody cleansed because from this point, if you even touch the bottom of this mountain, you're going to die. And if you do this, you're going to die. And if both of y'all do that, both of y'all are going to die. And I'm like, what ticked God off? From my, my view, I'm looking at what happened because they were, they were uh, allowed to touch the bottom of the mountain uh, before. There's something that took place that I don't think we noticed. Uh, what happened before Exodus 19, 8, and then God, uh, everything changed after Exodus 19 and 8, and these three words are the only things that I can see we will do. And if you read this entire chapter, you'll notice in the next few chapters, Immediately, he begins to establish the law. The law was something that was perfect. It was flawless. It represented God's character. You, you, you knew God based on the law that he gave because there was, there was no in-between. It was perfect. However, it was too perfect for a fallen man to be able to keep 
with his own performance and, 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 and his own effort. So you can see clearly I'll draw to conclusion and then we'll see it as we teach it today, that God was saying to those who said we will do, he was saying not by yourself you won't. He was saying something a little deeper. He was saying you by yourself, you are not enough to do what I sent you. So the law was sent to condemn that which was perfect, was sent to condemn man. Listen to this now. The law of Moses was sent to condemn man. Now remember, the, 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 the condemnation was all about this sense of not enough. And the law was sent to convince mankind you're not enough. Now imagine Christian people trying to keep something that was sent to condemn you. Yes, it's flawless. Yes, it's perfect. But it was sent to say to you, not enough. Because as they tried to keep the law, they constantly failed, constantly failed, constantly failed. The failure was so bad, if you keep reading uh, from Exodus on, the, the, it was so bad that God had to institute the sacrificial system of bringing sacrifices to a priest to cover your sins just so you can make it another year. You think that, that it lasted another year. No, in some cases, they bought a sacrifice. It was acceptable. The blood of the animals covered their sin, and then 15 minutes after they walked away, they sinned. So they had to live under sin condemnation, sin consciousness, for the rest of the year until they could get back here to present another sacrifice to cover it. So now you're dealing with condemnation. You're dealing with constantly seeing that you're not enough, that you're not enough, that you're not enough. And now you're dealing with the creation of sin consciousness. You're now more conscious of sin than anything else. And so that's a summary of putting everything together and shows you this is not the way of the new covenant. And yet Christian people are still fighting to live by a law that brings condemnation. Church full of people that show up at church feeling like I'm not enough because they are coming week after week knowing they hadn't kept this, they hadn't kept that, they hadn't kept this. And you know what, what's going on ultimately? You're not enough, you're not enough, you're not enough. And so condemnation and the feeling of not enough leads you to sin more. And it's happening with the stuff that the majority of the body of Christ is coming to church. They're coming to church and they're hearing the law. They're hearing do good and you'll get good. And so what happens is when you don't get good, you, you'll say, oh my God, that's because I didn't do good. <laughs> and you're constantly beating yourself up. You get up in the morning and you say, Lord, forgive me for the sin I hadn't even done yet because you're more conscious of sin than you are the righteousness of God. So how does this teaching fit today? It fits with every individual that has not seen the gospel of grace yet, and they're still stuck into the law. And you know, eventually you have to act phony to make it seem like you're actually doing it. And then you have to start judging somebody to make you feel better about yourself not being able to do it. And then eventually you have to start taking sin and dividing it into big sin versus little sin when there was never that division in the whole Bible, was never that division of big sin, little sin, sin was just sin. Is everybody following me? So now we move, and, and listen, there are still people, when you're living by the law, it's so hard to see grace. All you got, all, all you got to do is back up when, before you heard the message of grace and remember your struggle. You kept trying over and over again. You have to lie to be able to say you perfected it. You have to, because ain't nobody in this house was able to keep the law perfectly. For if you were, you would be called Savior. 
And there was only one Savior, and there was only one man that could perfectly keep the law. And the Bible says he kept it every jot and tittle. So the next time you brag about how many commandments you've kept this week, if you hadn't kept all of them, keep your mouth closed. Because James says if you have offended in one area, then you're guilty of the whole thing. Are you listening to me? Now, that's humbling to hear, right? Now, all of a sudden, your religious, your, your religious pride is like, oh, okay, so what we got here? <laughs> you came in here bragging on, well, I'm apostle, I'm prophet. And you, apostle and prophet, that's still going to be under condemnation and you're still not enough. Your title will not make you enough. Your so-called anointing won't make you enough. Glory to God. The only person that can make you enough is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's the only one that can make you enough. Now, that's foundation. Let's get started. <laughs> All right, John chapter 3, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna trace from condemnation to grace. From condemnation to grace. Now, John chapter 3, verse 17, and I want, I want you to read this out, out loud with me. St. John chapter 3, verse 17. He says, for God sent not, well, let's back up a little bit. You, you're familiar with verse 16. Let's look at verse 16 because I want you to see it in the context. Verse 16 says, for God so loved the world, so he, love was his motivation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, watch this, whosoever believeth in him, what? Okay, so what do you have to do to not perish? Believe, Believe in him, right? Uh, and so what does belief look like? It looks like to total dependence on God. See, eventually we've got to get from the point of saying, I believe, and not really know what that means. To believe something is to receive something, and then what you believed and receive equals dependence upon it. What you believe equals dependence upon it. Abraham had faith in God that he was going to give uh, 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 was going to have a child, like God said, all right? He was fully persuaded. But what was he, what was it really? He was dependent on God because he couldn't depend on himself. Bruh, 100 years old, he's shooting blanks. He can't depend on himself. <laughs> he cannot depend on himself. But he believed God, which means that he depended on God. And Abram was 90, those eggs were fried, diced, chopped, and every, you understand? <laughs> She couldn't do nothing but depend on God, but their dependence on God is called believing. I need to say that to you because I don't want you to just keep articulating, I believe, and it's not matching, I depend. Are, are you listening to me? I depend on God when I'm sick. I depend on God when I'm in lack. I depend on God when I'm acting like a fool. I depend on God when, I, when I'm hurting. And all of a sudden, none of those things will have victory over you because of your declaration of dependence on him, which now translates and means, I believe. So he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth or depends on him, he's not going to perish, but he's going to have everlasting life. Now, please understand something. When you believe in the Lord Jesus, you have everlasting life. Somebody says, when are you going to have everlasting life? When you die? No, when the day you start believing on Jesus, you now, you have everlasting life because he is everlasting life. He is everlasting life. Everlasting life is not time, honey. Everlasting life is a person. Y'all know that's in the Bible, don't you? <laughs> Show it to us. I ain't got time. I'm already, I, you know. Everlasting life is a person. The day you believe on Jesus, everlasting life. You have everlasting life. All right, now watch this. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus in the world to tell you that you're not enough. He sent Jesus in the world to tell you, I'm here, I'm getting ready to end all of those insufficiencies. He sent him into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved from being not enough. Saved from guilt. 
Saved from not enough. Saved from condemnation. Whew. Jesus was sent in the world, not to condemn it. So if he wasn't sent to condemn, how many you know we're not to be, we're not supposed to be condemning people or judging people? That is one of the major things you see in the church today is slanderous judgment motivated by mammon. In other words, most of the people that slander folks, there's some money involved somewhere that's motivating your slander. Are you listening to me? Jesus was not sent to condemn the world, but to save the world. A lot of times we see things in general and we ignore the context. Jesus was not sent to condemn the world, to shame the world, to say to the world that you're not enough. I, literally, he says, I have come to end your shame, your blame, your guilt, your condemnation, because through me, you will get a free gift of no condemnation and begin to do outstanding things because the root has been dealt with. Condemnation is the root to a lot, of, it's the root to all sin. And if you can deal with the root to all sin, how many of you know the fruit is going to be greatly damaged? Yeah. All right, now, we can see the huge difference between the condemnation of the Pharisees and the salvation of Jesus in this story we, we left off with last week dealing with a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. Look at Luke chapter 19, and let's begin at verse 1 in the, um, let's go with the uh, NLT, Luke chapter 19, verse 1. So you're going to see the difference between the condemnation of the Pharisees and the salvation of Jesus. Somehow the church has been convinced that we can maybe see people transform their life by condemning them. Condemn them, make them feel bad, tell them they're going to go to hell by 12. And Jesus is getting ready to show you that he can do so much more without condemnation than people with condemnation. I, I remember when I first got into ministry, most of the ministries that, that, that I was with and, 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 the, and the pastors and preachers, they used condemnation, okay? You know, we, we, we do stuff like, you know, God didn't, uh, what was that, about Adam and Eve and Adam and Steve. And, and th that wouldn't happen to nobody. That was condemning people. You know what they do? Just don't come no more. You can do so much more through compassion than you can do through condemning. And then as parents, we turn it around and make it reverse psychology. It's still condemning. You better watch out. You're going to be just like your no good for nothing daddy. Look at you. You're already acting like it. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to do it some more because I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> daddy don't look too bad to me. <laughs> Transformation is blocked if condemnation is your motivator. All right? Look at this. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. Uh, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short. So he, you already know his, he already got the Napoleon complex. He already got an issue. <laughs> I'm rich and short. He already got an issue. <laughs> but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree. Turn to your neighbor and say, you sick of yours? <laughs> Somebody said, I'm sick of more. <laughs> Besides the road, he said, for Jesus was going to pass that way. So when Jesus came by, he looked up. Isn't that something? God knows when your time is going to be. You ain't got to announce it. You ain't got to try to set up nothing. 
It's the same way with David, man. David was in the back tending to the sheep, and all them boys was up there, and, and, and the prophet said, ain't hey, none of these, they not the one. You, you sure you ain't got one more? Yeah, we got one boy, but he ain't none of the little red-headed boy back down there, and they called him up. Call him here. See, God knows when to call you, all right? You just keep doing what God told you to do last, and he knows how to call you up front. And while I'm at it, let me say, those of you who are, have been the last, get ready. There's a season coming where he's getting ready to call the last to the front. So your boss better watch out. You might end up being his boss. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. My God, called him by name. Imagine that. Imagine what that did for him. He, Jesus, know me. <laughs> Jesus, know me. Now, now, think about it now. You're Zacchaeus. Jesus, know me, and I've been stealing from these people. <laughs> Jesus, know me, and I've been taking advantage of these people. But Jesus, know me. I'm sure the religious people say, he need to condemn him. Why, why, how come Jesus know his name? and he don't know my name. I pray, I fast, I get my tithe, and he never called me by my name. In fact, when he told me to do this, he said, what's my call? Whatever, come here. <laughs> he called him by name, Zacchaeus, and he said, quick, come down. Now, you know Zacchaeus wasn't taking his time. He probably almost broke his ankle. He probably didn't climb down. He just, whoop, just came on down. Jesus said, quick. Because if Jesus said, do something, do it. He got you covered. Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. But Jesus, I ain't ready yet. My house dirty. And I'm not, no, 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 no. Because I believe before this service is over with, Jesus is going to be a guest in your home today. Now watch this. So Zacchaeus quickly clamped down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. I can't even imagine what that was like. All right, now understand something. So Zacchaeus wasn't saved at all. In fact, if you just kind of really look at it, nobody was because Jesus had not yet died yet. So Jesus is living in a situation where he is demonstrating and showing you the power of compassion over condemnation. But look what happened. But the people, the people. How many of you have ever encountered the people? Don't nobody know their names, but you encounter the people. You know, uh, Ray Ray Nim. And the question is, who is Nim? But the people were displeased. That's why you got to stay free from approval addiction. The people were displeased. The people were displeased. Doesn't mean you did something wrong. It just means that the people were displeased. And we're going to see if the devil can use that displeasure to get you off course, trying to please the people. How I many of you know that's the problem with a lot of Christians? They can't do what God tells them to do because they're trying to please the people. Well, you know, we don't want the people to do this. We don't know the people to do that. You know, it's, it's like, you know, a long time ago, I wouldn't wear jeans and a jacket because the people. <laughs> now I done been delivered. I don't care about no what, but people, what? <laughs> you weren't in my closet. I didn't ask you what to put on me this morning. You, the people, you got the greatest deliverance you'll ever experience is deliverance from people. God can't use you if you're concerned about the people. Man, I'm preaching a lot of sermons on the way to this one. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this church this morning. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not saying it because I want to or I plan to. It's y'all that came in, and by the Spirit of God, he's trying to address all these little stuff you done went through this past week because this week coming up not going to be like last week past. It's not going to be like last week past. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. And they grumbled. Everybody not going to be happy for you 
when the blessing of God come on your life. Don't expect them to congratulate you. Don't expect them to celebrate you. Expect them maybe to grumble and have a problem. They'll, they'll start talking. Everybody, oh, I'm so proud of her. Oh, she's da 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 They always want to group. Well, you ain't all that now. <laughs> and they grumble. Meanwhile, see, that's what you got to do. Let them talk and you stay in the meanwhile. <laughs> meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, check this out. He stood up, my God, and he said, now get a picture. They're, they're sitting down, eating, Jesus enjoying whatever they got. Because even if it tastes bad, he, he the Lord, he can change it. He make it. <laughs> he'll, season that, he'll season that thing up while going from the plate to his mouth. <laughs> Ooh, I can't. <laughs> Y'all pray for me now, okay? <laughs> I will, he stood up and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I don't know why he said if, you cheated people on their taxes. <laughs> I will give them back four times as much. Okay, where did this come from? You, you don't see Jesus saying nothing about what he did. You don't see Jesus judging what he did. You don't see Jesus condemning what he did. Jesus was there calling him by his name, showing him compassion, eating whatever they eating, just sitting there enjoying life, and all of a sudden, the transformation came. Watch this, because there was no condemnation. When there is no condemnation, the transformation can take off. When there is no condemnation, the changes will take place. It was just like that woman who was taken in the act of adultery. Jesus said, anybody condemn you? He said, no, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. And watch now what she was able to do with the no gift of condemnation. She was able to do what he said, go and sin no more. But as long as there was condemnation, judgment, stuff, you're going to keep sinning. You're going to keep sinning. But when there's no condemnation, there's something supernatural that can take place. Supernatural transformation can take place. And this guy stood up without Jesus not even addressing the issue and said, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to restore everybody fourfold. And anybody I cheated, I'm going to go ahead and, and give them back. I, I, all right, all right. And look what Jesus said. Jesus said, looked at him and basically said, okay. <laughs> he responded, salvation has come to the, this home today. For this man has shown himself, glory to God, to be a true son of Abraham. Supernatural, man. And, and we, we don't see the harm that we do when we bring condemnation to people. Time somebody is courageous enough to open up to you, you think your sermon needs to be filled with condemnation. That's not how this works. Boy, if we can get the church to understand this, that one lunch with unconditional love and undeserved grace of Jesus and a man changed forever. Wow. The preaching and the demonstration of the gospel of grace causes the power of God to manifest and to bring a whole lot more fruit versus condemnation. And condemnation will never accomplish what this compassion can accomplish. Jesus wasn't sent to condemn the world, but to save and to bring real change. So, we do not, likewise, like Jesus, we do not have the ministry of Moses. So I said, what was the ministry of Moses? The ministry of condemnation. We have the ministry of Jesus. We do not have the ministry of condemnation. We have the ministry of reconciliation. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in the NLT, verses 18 and 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. We don't have the ministry of condemnation. Let me give you a, a quick definition again of condemnation. It means to pronounce unfit, guilty, unusable. 
Judgment is associated with it. Punishment is associated with it. Disapproval is associated with it. It simply means you're not enough. You're not enough. I've taught the subject of com com uh, condemnation many times, but this time around teaching it, I, I closed my Bible, I put my pen down, I stopped writing, and I asked the Lord, have I been walking in condemnation for a lot of my life? And I paused. And I'm like, I don't want nobody deceived into thinking this condemnation is not really my issue. And now it becomes this huge issue because it's a root cause of stuff in your life. A root cause to every fear I've ever fought. And somehow in my head, I thought, well, I only got about a couple more fears to go. And it's like, that wasn't true. And then I would pray, Lord, please don't let me deceive myself. Please don't let religion get on me and I think that I am what I'm not. Because one day I'm going to stand before the light. And I'd like to know it. I don't want, to be a, I don't want it to be a big shocker. And, and that ain't what heaven going to be like. Heaven ain't going to be like you at the gate. Hmm, you think I don't know about you? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, 18, 19. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself. How did he bring us back? How did he reconcile us back to himself? Through Christ. When I got born again, he brought me back to himself. And God has given us this task. He says, now, now that you've experienced reconciliation, here's a task I want to give you, the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Did you see that? He said, now that they're in Christ, we are no longer counting your sins against you. Now, that's not a license. Well, since he ain't counting my sins, then I might as well go ahead and sin. You don't know Jesus. You, I don't believe you believe. And he gave us the wonderful message of reconciliation. Now, this is what over the last month, and I've not, not struggled with it, but tossed around. I knew that I had to teach this before I can close this series up. That there is something about serving in the newness of the Spirit versus operating in the oldness of the letter because most people I know in America that go to church are operating in the oldness of the letter. I, I saw this video. I don't know who showed it to me. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have laughed, but it, it was hilarious to me. And this preacher just, he lost it. He like snapped. And he started going around telling people, you're going to hell. Anybody see that? You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And the guy was playing the drums, and he said, stop playing the drum. You're going to hell too. <laughs> And then he had the audacity to start hooping it. You going to hell? You going to hell? You going to hell? Oh, y'all going to hell. <laughs> I'm like, boy, he's really fed up. He is absolutely having a hell feast. <laughs> but that's the letter. And so all believers... First of all, and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're gonna, in the NLT, we're going we're gonna to look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in the NLT, verse 6. All believers have been called to minister by the Spirit. Now, I got to say this again. All believers are called to minister now. I ain't no minister. Oh, brother. Everybody in here, everybody that's made Jesus a lot of their lives, you have been called to minister. You know what minister means? It's, 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 it means servant. 
It means servant. It's not some big fancy name for the dude that's in the pulpit. That's why I used to preach on the floor a lot because I'm thinking I'm not going to, you know, I just re was rebelling against everything with the tradition of ministers. Minister is a servant. And every, everybody's been called to, to serve. Okay? You're, 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 you're ministers. So I would not be out of line if I ever came up to you and say, hey, Minister Ralph. I ain't no preacher. I ain't say he was a preacher. I said, you're a minister. You're a servant. You're, you're, you serve men and women in this calling of reconciliation. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 6. What does this have to do with this, this uh, issue of uh, condemnation? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 6. He says, he has enabled us to be ministers of the new covenant. You are not ministers of the law, nor are you ministers of the old covenant, which condemns. But you have been called and equipped and enabled to be ministers of the new agreement, the new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws. You're not a minister of the covenant of the written laws. You're not a Ten Commandment minister. Don't call you, don't get no, that's not you. You are a minister of the new covenant. This is a covenant not written of written laws, but it is of the Spirit. Go back. It's the covenant, you are a covenant of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in condemnation and death. But this new covenant, you're under the new covenant, and the Spirit gives life. Wow. We are not ministers of the old covenant. Say out loud, I am a minister of the new covenant. There's nowhere else in the Bible except the New Covenant that you have been called to be a minister, and everybody's been called to be a minister. That wasn't so under the Old Covenant. Second Corinthians chapter 3, 6, it, 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 it said something there. Did, did you see the word? Let's, let's read it again. Go back, go back again. He has enabled us to be ministers of the New Covenant. This covenant was not written a lot, but of the Spirit, the Old uh, uh, Written Covenant ends in death, but the New ends in life or it gives, gives life. Now, the King James says it like this. Look at verse 6 in the King James. <clears throat> he says, Who's, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, watch this phrase. The letter killeth. What does that mean? For us today, the letter killeth, that phrase, the letter kills, is the system of performance-based Christianity. The letter that kills is performance-based Christianity, where we try to serve God and work to please Him in order to earn His blessing and His love. So the letter killeth simply means I got to be good in order for God to be good to me. The letter that killeth says, my performance determines God's performance. The letter that killeth says, if I don't do, God don't do. You're not, an, you are, you're not a minister of, of, of the letter because the letter killeth. The letter says, without my performance to please God so that he will do something good to me, then I fail. And now you're not enough, because now you go back. If you don't get God to do what you've been trying to get him to do, now, guess what you're going to hear loud and clear? You're not enough. You're not enough. That's why it didn't happen. You're not enough. You laid hands on the sick, they died. You're not enough. You sowed a seed, no harvest never came. You're not enough. You walked in, in love with a relationship, it was still dissolved. You're not enough. Guess what happens to you after being ministered that? You just go and continue to sin. The, the, the sufficiency of God only comes as we ministers, as we ministered the new. Verse 6 uses the word gives, all right? Now, now, follow me carefully here. This is just a side note. The word give 
could have been translated transfer or create. All right? The Spirit gives life, or the Spirit transfers life, or the Spirit creates life. You see, words in the New Covenant are like containers of life within them. And so what happens, the ministry of the New Covenant gives what it speaks of, while the ministry of the Old Covenant only puts forth outward requirements. It's like, well, let's, let's move down. I'll show you in the Scripture. It's still in the NLT. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, 3, and then move on down to verse 6. I, I'm, I'm going to show you something here. I'm, something is happening right now while I'm preaching to you. You, you might not even notice it. You will, you will once I, I show it to you. But right now, every time you hear the gospel of grace, something is transferred into you. Glory be to God. Look at this verse 2. The only letter of recommendation we need to, uh, is, for, is, is, is you yourself. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Glory be to God. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with a pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but it's carved on your human heart. So as, as we minister the, this, this, this new covenant, the Holy Spirit writes on your heart. It writes on the hearts of the listener. And substance is being transferred. Y'all yeah, don't hear what I'm saying. I I'm preaching to you this morning. You think you're just hearing a sermon. But I'm transferring the life that... I just, somebody got to hear what I'm saying. Something is being created in you every time you hear New Covenant teaching and you're trying to figure out why am I feeling different? Why am I feeling like I can? Why are, what, what's going on with me? When you sit and listen to the life of the New Covenant, there's a designation to write on your heart where you become the letter. And you ain't got to read no letter. That's about to write you a letter. When you show up and they see what comes out of you, they say the letter has been written without ink or pen. So it's dangerous to come to church here at World Changes. You get wrote on. <laughs> Somebody say, write on me. 2 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. Now watch verse 4 and 6 now. We are confident of all this. Why? Because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Oh, that's much different than what we read in Exodus, right? Since we don't think we're qualified to do anything on our own, our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of the new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but it's a covenant of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death and condemnation, but under this new covenant, the Spirit gives life. So he has made us sufficient to minister this new covenant way. Now, Paul said something like this, Romans, Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 in the NLT, Romans 7 and 6. Paul said something, and he writes something uh, to the church in Rome concerning this, and look what he said. He says, but now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. 
My God, that's powerful. So, in the oldness of the letter, there were requirements put forth. Requirements to fear because condemnation could be the result if people felt that they didn't measure up. I guarantee it is the result. So what does that look like under the oldness of the letter and then the fear of, of not measuring up? It looks like this. I need to improve so, I, so I'll pray more. If I just try harder, the breakthrough's gonna come. If I just try harder, it's gonna come. If I only get more faith, my miracle will manifest. I just need more faith. My problem is that, and, and if I only this, and, and what I need to do is this. If you'll notice, under the onus of the letter, the focus is entirely on themselves. The focus is on what they, if they, could, if they could do that, and if they had more of this, the focus was on them. And that's what the oldness of the letter is. And that's what religion is. And that's what much, most churches right now, the focus is on you. It's, it's people preaching, you do this, you do this. The focus is on you. And we still, we still don't get it. I'm going to church so I can just, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. I got to do this, I got to do that. What, 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 it's not happening. It's, it's, oh, God, I just, I, re, I, remember, I remember right when I got a hold of the, of, the, of the gospel of grace was right after I put all the focus on what I could do to see if somehow we could get a relative healed. Okay, I need, I need, to, I need to pray for three hours a day, three hours a day for the next 20 days ought to do it. No, 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 I need to use the whole bottle of oil, not a touch. Just, just, just put it there, just everything, let it drip. <laughs> and some of y'all remember this. I, I wore the little, the little thing while I was praying for folks. I, maybe that'll do it. I, I wore the, 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 the prayer shawl and maybe that'll boost my prayer power. <laughs> the focus was on me. Now, I, wasn't, it wasn't, I was tripping out. I was doing everything. I, I just, I thought it was, I got to, I got, I mean, it's a, I focused totally on me. And when they died, I was devastated. I, I did it. I did everything they told me to do. I, I confessed the 10 pages of confessions. The focus was on me. And when that happened, I said, something wrong. I, Lord, I still believe you, but something, something not lining up. I did all of it, some not lining up. And in my frustration, sitting at my desk, determined I am not going to go to bed until I see what doesn't line up. In my spirit, I heard this question. Will you become a student of grace? I heard it. And I thought, well, I already am a student of grace. And I start asking him a question. You know how God is. He, 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 he ain't going to be going back and forth with you. You heard what he said. <laughs> He's not negotiating with you over the question. And I took that little bit. And I came in the office next day and I said, I need, I need a run me off a copy of every scripture in the Bible that has the word grace. And that's where I started. And I started seeing the contradiction. I saw how grace was used in different ways, and, but then something was happening when Jesus was fulfilling the law. And, and I'm like, well, what is grace? And I, I limited it to love. And, and I kept digging, and I'm thinking, it, it's not quite love. And then I went into John, and John was like, Jesus is full of grace and truth, and so now Jesus got something to do with this grace. And I said, but what's the truth? Because I thought grace and truth were two different entities, and I didn't know that grace is the truth. And Jesus was somehow grace. And so I went through the Word, now in the New Testament, every time I saw the grace, I said Jesus. And every time I saw Jesus, I said grace. 
And I saw Jesus, who is love. You get the point. And I said, oh, my God. It's not about me. It's about you. And I ran out the house, and I was in the middle of the field, and I lift my hands up, and I said, God, for the rest of my life, I'm going to dig in this thing called grace, in this person called Jesus. And I start bumping into stuff, and I said, I knew what I learned wasn't you, but what I read here, that's you. And the Lord put in my spirit, he said, now, it's going to cost you. I said, well, how much? What, what I need to do? How much is <laughs> He said, no, I'm going to first finish the revelation dealing with you. And he started rearranging my furniture. And I started becoming stuff like, what's happening to me? You know, crying in front of folks. Preaching love, being patient, getting convicted when I said certain stuff. What's going on? And then it was revelation after revelation after revelation, but the number one revelation was everything you trying to do, I've already done. And you keep trying to be like me without me. Oh. And the journey continues today. I will never stop being a student of grace. And what it cost me, it cost me a lot. It cost me, you know, members. People heard this message and they said, he's finally lost it. That's it, he's lost it. People I love, people I care about, people, he's lost it. Oh my God, because we never dealt with the contradiction. And so one of the things I'm called to do is wherever I can find a contradiction, I want to deal with it. I, I, I found one this morning where it said, you know, it, you know if, if you're under the law, you should be able to carry it out. And people think, see there, uh-huh, you can carry it out. That ain't what it meant. He says, when you try to keep the law, you can carry out all of the law, including the animal sacrifices to, uh, uh, to, to get you covered, but you ain't never going to be able to do this. You can, you can carry it out because you now know it but you ain't going to be successful. <sighs> Everybody got all that? In the oldness of the letter, there were requirements put forth, and that fear of condemnation always focused on you. But in the newness of the Spirit, There was not set forth an outward requirement, but rather it provides spiritual conditions by focusing on the finished works of Jesus Christ. People will be encouraged in their faith, in their faith and fruit. Here's what it sounds like for people who are in the newness. Wow, isn't God good? Jesus has done all that needs to be done on the cross, and now I can just rest in him. There's nothing I need to add. What he did is enough. Even before I start the fast, I'm already included in what Jesus did on the cross. I'm counting in. What wonderful good news and what a great Savior we have. You notice the difference? Their focus is on Christ in them and what the goodness of God has already So now there's this challenge between serving in the ministry of righteousness versus serving in the ministry of condemnation. And we read verse 7, let's go on to 11 in the NLT, and then I want to show you something real quick. He says, well then, I'm suggesting that the law of God is sinful. Well then, I'm suggesting that the law of God is sinful. Of course not. 
In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known the, that, that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used its command to arouse. Wait a minute. I, that, while that is great and that is good, that's the wrong scripture. That's 2 Corinthians. I'm like, that is awesome, great, read it on your own. That ain't where I'm going right now. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11. I apologize, I didn't tell y'all that. The old way with laws etched in stones led to death. I, I don't know about one thing that was etched in stone. It was perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law's perfect. The problem is, is you and I are not, and you got imperfect people trying to keep something that's flawless. That ain't gonna work. The old way with law etched in stones led to death. Though it began with such glory, it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. That's why he covered it up with a veil. Because in leadership, if they see this thing leaving, they might not follow me no more. Shouldn't we expect far greater under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all when you compare it with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, it's been replaced, if it was glorious, then how much more glorious is the new which remains forever. If you could, pull up that chart just a little bit. So now we are comparing the new way with the old way. We compare the new way with the old way. And so you see the ministry of the old covenant versus the ministry of the new covenant. And so under the old covenant, it's by letter. Under the new covenant, it's by spirit. But under the old covenant, it kills. The letter kills. Under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. Under the old way, you have the ministry of death. It ministers death and condemnation. Under the new way, you have the ministry of the Spirit. Under the old way, it was glorious, but the glory was passing. Under the new way, it was more glorious than that of the old covenant. Under the old covenant, you had the ministry of condemnation. If you live under the old covenant and under the old way of doing it, you're going to be ministered to all the time. You're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. It has the ministry of condemnation. Under the new way, you have the ministry of righteousness. Under the old, we're talking about what was. You had glory. Under the new, it exceeds in much more in glory. Under the old, uh, we, we, we read it was glorious. Under the new covenant, it, it exceeds much more in glory. Under the old covenant, it was passing away. Under the new covenant, it excels and it remains. See, the difference is, and, and, and here's what I'm trying to get people to see. You're thinking I'm telling people, you know, something's wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. Something's wrong with us. <laughs> and God gave that law, and it, it represents him, and it's flawless, and it's perfect, to, to finally try to shake you up and say, you can't do this by yourself. It's kind of like, like Jack Nicholson. You remember, I forgot the name of the movie, and he was in the court, and then he said, well, tell us the truth, tell us the truth. And he, and, and he freaked out. He said, you can't handle the truth. And it's the same way when they were looking under the old covenant and they had the law of God. It was God. It represented God. It was flawless. It was perfect. You can't handle it. But you still think you can. We go to seminaries who don't get it. You go to your, your hero. And I was going to read the scripture today, uh, but I put, a, I put a, a question mark by it where it says, don't exalt 
your human leaders. Because they didn't do it. And I said, let me hold up on that. And see, I didn't hold up on it. I told you anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got like 47 seconds. Okay, here's what I'm going to show you. How did Paul handle condemnation? Paul didn't condemn people. He just kept reminding them of who they were and what they had. I'll show you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He didn't condemn people. He just continued to say, don't you know this? Don't you realize this? Look at this. So you meet somebody and they're in fornication and they keep sleeping around and all kinds of stuff keep going on and you're like, well, I can't just ignore this. I got to just tell them to stop. Something wrong with this. And no, 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 no. That's when you remind people of who they are and what they have. Paul said, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. He kept reminding them of who they were and what they had. God's eyes are on the perfection of Jesus' work, not on our sin. His eyes are on the perfection of his work, not on our sins. And then Paul kept saying this, do you not know? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 through 3. Do you not know? Do you not know? So he was addressing it, but not by condemning them. He says, don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even this little thing among yourself? He was talking to people that, you know, you know Christian people who were taking one another to court. He says, dude, he didn't go up there and say, you know, you ought to be ashamed of yourself taking somebody to court like that. He said, don't you, don't you, don't you know that one day you're going to be doing this? He kept showing them who they were and what they had. That's how you do that. You take a brother or sister who's got enough guts to come to you and say, I've been sleeping around. The response shouldn't be, you, you're going to be in hell by, by 11.30, I guarantee you. 11.30, <laughs> you're in hell. You're in hell. It ain't lunchtime, 11.30. You're going before lunchtime. <laughs> you know what you've done? You've set up the next appointment. Because yeah. I'm that condemned to hell. Might, mighty well. Or you could say, hey, let me remind you, you're the righteousness of God. And that body, man, do you not know or have you forgotten? That's God's temple. Man, he lives in you. He loves you. Man, he dwells in earthen vessels, and you're, you're the carrier of the creator of the universe. You say, I love you, man, and God loves you. And he ain't taking nothing good that he gave you away from you. Just remember who you are. That's how we're supposed to be handling that. If you handle it any other way, you're just trying to cover up your own stuff. You ought to do like those old men who dropped the stone. Well, you know, I can't, I can't say nothing because, you know, Two, three, when I was, you know, I was born again just like you. <laughs> you, you you're doing good compared to what I did. You know? <laughs> Where you going? The stone over there, I got to go. You know, this, this thing making me nervous again. <laughs> but we don't do that because we're so doggone sanctimonious that we got to let people know. Okay, I'm not going to say that. That's a little condemning. So I won't even say that out of an out of a illustration because the pulpit has been moved from Mount Sinai to Golgotha. I, I, think, I think that's enough. I may have one more to deal with this because I want to compare inferiority with condemnation. Every man and woman has the foundation of inferiority in their life. 
Why? For we all have sin and watch inferiority and fallen short of the glory of God. That part falling short is inferiority. And there's only one way, I guess I'm dealing with it now, there's only one way you can deal with inferiority in Christ. Amen. Other than that, if you don't get in Christ and you still are walking around with the curse of inferiority, you know what you'll do? You'll pretend that you're superior. And you'll try to address your inferiority through fake superiority. And that's where racism comes, that's where sexism comes, all of that comes because of people who want to cover their inferiority rather than dealing with the only solution for your, your, your inferiority. And so a man is less than a man because he covers his inferiority while he walks in, an, in a fake superiority which ends up in abuse and ends up in all kinds of things because you faking it and now in fear and condemnation you're frustrated because you can't let the real you be seen. I'm done. Bow your heads. The clock says zero. It's time to stop. <laughs> uh, so Lord, uh, you know, here we are. And uh, we're pretty convinced by your word that Jesus has delivered us from feeling like we don't measure up, feeling like we are not cared about, feeling like we're not enough. The shame, the guilt, all of that is taken care of in you. So Lord, that's, that's our solution, you. For those who are tired of the rat race of shame, condemnation, inferiority, we decide today that in you, we find our deliverance and our healing and our victory from those things. We want to do it in the newness of what you've provided and the glory to come over our lives. We receive the free gift of no condemnation. We uproot that. We come against it now. And as we uproot condemnation, we uproot fear. As we uproot fear, we, we uproot stress. As we uproot stress, we uproot the manifestations of the curse. May your blessings be so strong upon these, your people, that surely as you rearrange the furniture on the inside of me and moving stuff around still, let us rejoice that we know you and you know us by name. We praise you for it now. And Lord, as we prepare to give and to bring our offerings, this is as much a part of our worship towards you than anything that we've done thus far. That under this new covenant, we need to, we get to give because we want to. Under this new covenant, we give out of a cheerful heart. We give out of our heart. Under this new covenant, we can give generously because we have no fear, no condemnation, no fear of a curse, and not giving out of necessity but give because you love people who will do things for you from their hearts. So all of us here today, speak to us. Show us how to give. We, we, we trust that you will lead our giving today. And as we give, we give 
clarifying again and again that you take care of us. We will no longer try to be the provider of our own lives because in doing so, we'll always be afraid to give. We trust you and we tie our giving life into our life. And we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. The ushers will minister to you. I want you more and more not to separate giving from everything else we do, but right in the middle of praying for stuff, we're praying of this because this is a part of our lives. It's not a scheme involved in it. It's between you and God, and you are giving generously as the Spirit of God leads you to give. That's how that rocks. And as you prepare your gifts, I want you to know everything in your life, including the material areas of your life, the areas that need to be dealt with, the areas that you need to have the grace of God to provide for. Grace upon grace upon grace is provision for everything in our lives. Not just one area, but grace upon grace is every area. Abundant provision, that's that grace. That's what that grace is too. It's abundant provision in the operation, the supernatural operation of his infinite love and giving us an opportunity. Putting yourself in a position to depend on God. Thank God I got an opportunity to give because that definitely does it. I put myself in just in that one area in a position to depend on God. If you're a part of our e-church this morning or you're here with us through some other means or technologies, the ways to give are on the screen. And we are so thankful and grateful to our e-church, people who are out of town who just cannot get to this location. We're grateful to them. We're grateful to our New York church, our Orlando church, all, all of the other churches that are operating today, we are thankful and grateful for them. And I am so grateful that I get to be here with you each Sunday morning, and I'm just having a hard time going out of town because I love being here cooking in this kitchen. Love it. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get ready to give. Take your offerings out. Father, this is our gift that we give out of our heart, that we sow, that enables us to continue to minister to people, that enables us to be a blessing, Lord Jesus. And I thank you that your word is true, that when we give, Lord, you give to us, and we thank you, Lord, that you take care of us, and, and what we sow, Lord, you multiply it back unto us. But that is not the motivation behind our giving. We give because we love you. And we're grateful for all that you have done. Bless this act now in Jesus' name, an act of gratitude for all that you have done for us. And all that agree said, amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive this offering this morning. You get anything out of that this morning? I hope you did. Go, go and study it, continue to study it, continue to look at it, and let God give you more and more. Now, those of you who are remaining, if you are not born again and you would like to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you're not saved, but you want to be saved today, if you're not in Christ and you want to be in Christ today, if you're maybe in religion but not in Christ, all that can change one decision on your behalf. So if you're not born again, make your way down front. We would love to pray with you. Secondly, if you're here and you want to reactivate your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, to rededicate your life to the Lord, then you can come down to this altar as well. Thirdly, if you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, then it's available to you right now. And last but not least, if God is calling you 
to join this church today. You feel like this is the brook where you and your family uh, should be and you feel like you can eat from this brook, then you can come and we'll receive you today. I've given to you four things, an opportunity to get born again, an opportunity to reactivate your relationship, an opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an opportunity to join the church. Uh, everybody in here already knows what you want to do. And I used to think that somehow I had the power to get you out your seat. You know, you got the power to get you out your seat. My, my job is to only make the opportunity available to whosoever will let them come. Amen? And so we thank God for that opportunity. Those of you who are online and want to join our e-church, you can just go to worldchanges.org and click join at the top of the page, or you can text join WCCI, all one word, 51555, and we'll send you all of the benefits of e-membership. Anybody else going once, going twice, going three times, that's it. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. Thank God for those who have come down. Stretch your hands towards each person as to this altar. Father, we thank you that they're never going to be the same again. We thank you that the glory of the new covenant comes upon their lives, begins to rearrange their furniture, and bring them into the very purpose of their life. We thank you, Lord, that today everything's turning around, and we give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, if you'll turn this way and follow this, this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and minister to you, give you biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you came to receive. You'll never be the same again. You may stand for the final blessing. Thank you so much for coming to church. <coughs> now unto the Spirit of grace. We thank you, Lord, that the angels have been commanded by God to watch over our lives. We thank you that doors are able to open and that we can walk through those doors, doors of promotion, doors of opportunity that come from you only. Thank you for divine protection this week, that any man or woman possessed by the devil and runs on a rage shall not come near you. For I plead the blood over your life, the life of your family, and may the spirit of increase visit your life. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. amen. Be blessed. Have a great day. Watch out there now. Hey, listen. <laughs> when I say God is good, listen, man, the word here at World Change is unmatched. God is just pouring out just unmatched. Too good. Too, too good. good to, too good too to be true good. news. I, I tell you the truth. Woo. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in uh, where you are, for being a part of this this uh, today's message, mm -hmm. and just also interacting with us. Right now, I just want to encourage you all, uh, take what you had. I know you got notes. I know you got a whole heap of yes. notes, but in your notes and in everything that you're doing, um, get this back in your in your spirit. Rewatch it. Mm -hmm. Share it with someone you love. Yes. Share it with yourself. Yes. Okay? <laughs> get this word in you, man. God is, God is good. This is a powerful, powerful, yes. powerful Sunday. Uh, what you get from today? I mean, okay, so I'm going to just be straight up. Mm -hmm. Today was just a, another day of confirmation. Because mm -hmm. for me personally, like I, I kept hitting you like, because uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> I've been reading uh, Exodus and I'm now in Leviticus. And I was reading about all the laws and all the things and all the things. And I was just like thinking about God's goodness. And it's like, man, Lord, you literally sent your son mm -hmm. to just wipe all of that out so we don't have to fall yeah. into that condemnation trap. Yeah. So yeah. for me, like today was just, I'm like sitting there like, Pastor, do you have my, my house bugged? <laughs> <laughs> do you have my phone bugged? <laughs> like, because uh -huh. literally conversations that we've had, yep. that I've had with friends and family just reading, I'm sitting there like, 
every, like literally every single thing he said today. Listen. Everything. So listen. I'm like, listen. Listen. Woo -wee. <laughs> listen. No condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ, man. Again. What about amazing. you? Hey, man, listen, you? I got too much. <laughs> I got too much. I'm not about to preach. We're going to keep it moving because that's how good it was, man. Uh, we want to also know what you got from today's message. Share it in the comments right now. Share it yes. in the chat. Uh, share it with someone, man. Just inspire and mm -hmm. encourage them to also go back and rewatch mm -hmm. and replay today's service because, man, God is serious about your freedom. You do not have to live condemned. You can live this free life that he freely died to give you amen 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 all right guys so uh to not hold up anything but we want to make sure if you did not get an opportunity to give we want to make sure and extend that opportunity to you we have of course a few different ways that you can give you mm -hmm. can of course text the word world changers leave a space and then add your amount and text that to 74483 you can also mail in your gifts to 2500 Burdett road college park georgia 30349 mm -hmm. while you're online at worldchangers.org creflo dollar ministries.org well of course you can and also call in your gifts to 866-477-7683. Remember, we get to give. We give out of love, out of not love. out of any obligation, mm -hmm. not out of any, I'm afraid, God, no. no, God is good to us. Look what he did for us. Why wouldn't we want to give? Yes. Amen. 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 Man, listen, I'm, I'm telling Woo. you, I'm ready to rewatch already. Woo. Like, let it play. Listen, listen. <laughs> All right, so uh, again, uh, we have a few announcements of some upcoming events. Hey, I know what we got coming up. Ladies, <laughs> are you ready to bloom? <laughs> I'm so excited, y'all. We are less than 30 days away hmm. from our Women's Conference 2024 Bloom. Listen, I got my ticket. I got my mama ticket. I'm telling everybody <laughs> to get tickets. Listen less than 30 days yeah. so don't forget it don't miss it we have pastor taffy dollar laura pickett chrislyn mcnear dr anita phillips samira joy creflo dollar ty tribbett egypt sharad and many many more many, two many more. powerful <laughs> packed days march 14th and 15th come on out yeah. it's going to be a great time if you have not gotten your ticket yet text radical to 51555 to register or you can go online to taffydollar.org that's right i encourage you to be in the building that's i right. am ready to just sit and bask in everything and bloom even more you as a woman say that. i am i'm excited i don't know about y'all but i am too excited for this conference that's coming I'm up i'm excited Unless too than 30 days. I might be sitting in the back corner somewhere, <laughs> you know, sitting in, sit in a, a closet or something and take my own notes because, listen, y'all got me excited. Yeah. Uh, shout out to all the ladies. Yes. Uh, so, ladies, again, get your tickets. Men that you watching, get your lady a ticket. Yes. Get your lady a ticket. You know. You got some birthdays in March. Be like, yeah. hey, what do you want for your birthday? I want a bloom ticket. <laughs> I want a bloom. Yeah. <laughs> I want a bloom. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, next up, after that, we uh, New York. Those that are, that are in the New York area, surrounding mm -hmm. areas, we're coming to New York for Change Experience New York. This is our second stop of our Change Experience tour. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Now, if you've been tuning in to uh, the Daily Confessions throughout the week, Dollar Dollar's been dropping so many hints and so many nuggets of what to expect. We are declaring war on cancer. It's going to be amazing listen, you hear me listen, life changing this, i just thought about this i know that watching online is great it's mm -hmm. awesome but if you could just be in the building it's nothing like being in the building yeah. so i know that everybody's not located in georgia however if you are in the new york area or surrounding states make that trip yeah. plan that trip to be there yeah. on april 26th definitely so what you can do right now there's information on the screen but text change 2024 all one word to 51555 reserve your spot reserve your seat mm -hmm. tell your friends your cousins and all of them reserve their seat and y'all make y'all way to change experience new york it's going to be on april the 26th two sessions mm -hmm. friday april 26th so mark that in your calendars we're coming to new york it's going to be amazing take the day off do what you like i said again mm -hmm. it's nothing like being in those seats being in the building yeah. being a part of everything it's great online it's <laughs> Awesome, but let me tell you, even just being here on a Sunday, mm -hmm. any chance you, any opportunity you can, any opportunity, be in the building, be in the building, and last but certainly not least, we got a reunion coming Grace up. Grace Live. 
Grace Life 2024. Grace Gang, Grace Gang. Grace Gang, Gang Gang. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, um, for those that do not know, our amazing conference, Grace Life 2024, is back. It is the reunion. We are ready to reignite, mm -hmm. to reunite, and come back with all our family, our cousins, Listen. everybody. It's going to be amazing on July. I said July the 11th through the 13th right here in College Park. Last year, we had over 12,000 of you that came in mm -hmm. the building. So you only know it goes up. Yep. I said it goes up. It goes so up. So it only gets bigger and better. We are so excited for it. Man, it's going to be so amazing. The, the lineup is <sighs> Dr. Dollar, mm -hmm. Mike Smith, Andrea Creighton. Listen, okay. it, I, it's coming. Be in these it's blue be seats. Serious. I, I, be I in these blue I seats. I wouldn't lie to you. Listen. Might tell a joke, but I wouldn't tell a lie. Listen. <laughs> be in these seats. So make sure to text Grace Life, all one word, to 51555, or you can simply register by visiting creflodollarministries.org. We're going to be here in College Park. Grace Life, the reunion. Do not miss it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so last but certainly not least, if you're looking to stay up to date with all of our events, just be sure to visit worldchanges.org. Mm -hmm. Check out everything that's going on in the World Changes Nation. And listen, we want you all to have an amazing Sunday. Okay? Like we already said, get this word in you. Okay? It's about renewing your mind, not renewed. Not one time. Get it and let it replay over and over and over. And let this day be amazing. You and your family, get some rest. Get some good food. Yes. And enjoy this amazing week. All right? We love y'all. Have love a great week. Be blessed. A room filled with brilliant minds. Women gather to share and learn. Seeds of knowledge ready to bloom. Ideas blossoming as we discern. Experts, students, leaders alike. Each with her own light to shine. I break the bands of trauma in the name of Jesus that's trying to snuff out your garden. There is something you felt on the inside of you that built strength within you to give you the courage to go out and do what he has signed you to do. Could you consider cooperating with the plan? Since he has done what he has done. I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's on the inside of me than he that's in the world. When you begin to call those seeds that be not as though they were, by his stripes I am healed. But you have to make up your mind. I am ready. I'm not scared. You will not have my marriage. You will not have my mind. For we are not under the law, ladies. We are Grace. Are you ready to bloom? Shame.